He's Australia's most high-profile criminal lawyer. Adam Huda recently scored a major victory in the courtroom for his client Jessica Silva, charged with the murder of her ice-crazed partner. But Huda is best known as the go-to lawyer for a long line of men charged with terrorist-related offences. You've described Man Haron Monos, the Lint Cafe gunman, as um, the strangest client you've ever had. How so? Well, the first thing that struck me about Monos is uh, his unusual behaviour. I had a lady who I believe is the lady that has been murdered since that time, a lady that he had an affair with. She would call me on his behalf and arrange the meetings and she would call him his eminence and when I looked him up, he was non-existent. Nobody knew about him and I know most leaders in the community. So his madness was apparent from the first time I ever met him. But I never thought he was dangerous. Mad, yes, but not dangerous. Uh, he was a peace activist uh, and that's what attracted me to his case. And that's the Man Mona story. Now, during that siege, you actually fired off a tweet offering to actually go to the cafe and talk to Monas. What did you hope to achieve through that? I understand what Man Monas's grievances are. Now, I didn't believe that the police negotiators would be effective because to him, they are the enemy. So they were at a disadvantage from the get-go. Uh, I believe that I had a better chance at, at speaking to him and, and, and trying to convince him to end the siege. And I was sitting in the comfort of my own home. Uh, it didn't sit well with me that I, I didn't at least try to do something. So I put it out there, but no one took me up on my offer, but it was genuine. Adam, you were also part of the biggest uh, criminal trial in Australia, Operation Pendennis. Nine men accused of uh, terrorist-related offences began in 2005. But there were headlines about the fact that these men wouldn't stand in the court. Was that um, an uncomfortable time for you? Oh, well, my client's not standing, it's not a legal requirement to stand up. It's just part of the traditions of our legal system. Do, do, do you not find that a sign of disrespect though? You're part of the liberal justice system, a, a system you respect yourself, a system that's nurtured you. Don't you have a problem with the fact that they didn't stand? Uh, me personally, I didn't find it disrespectful. And I, I don't know if the judge found it disrespectful. I, I, it's only a question he can answer. But I certainly didn't find it disrespectful. Well, was there any ground, do you think, for them not standing in court at that time? Uh, that's the question you're going to have to pose to them. Uh, I can't answer for them. Uh, you know, they believe that they should stand and bow to God only and not to a human being. Uh, and that's their philosophy behind their actions. What was your reaction to the massacre in Charlie Hebdo offices in France in January? The Quran teaches us that the killing of one innocent soul is as if you've killed the entire humanity. So from a Muslim's point of view, any killing of innocent civilians is a grave, grave crime. I guess what I'm, I'm getting at here is that, that that attack was taken very personally by the French people because they saw it as an attack on their freedom, their freedom of speech. And Charlie Hebdo, the magazine, was known for taking ch shots, whether you call them sh cheap shots or not, at Jews, at Christians, as well as Muslims. So do you see that attack uh, as an attack on democracy, on free speech? Look, the cartoons were an attack on Islam. Uh, let's not kid ourselves here. And when it comes to this concept of free speech, yeah, it's wonderful, but it's a double standard uh, policy when it comes to Muslims. Uh, that magazine, uh, there were some cartoons that were offensive to, to some Jews and, and, and there was an uproar about it. So it just seems that when it comes to Muslims, there's a double standard on this issue of free speech. And, and that's what I find distasteful and that's what I find wrong. Australia, by um, many studies, has, has actually been shown to be the most tolerant society in the world. Um, despite all our problems, despite, you know, the episodes of racism, awful as they are. It's quite gratifying to look at studies like that. Do you think that comes from our secular tradition rather than any kind of, um, you know, religious um, aspect to our society? Well, firstly, I disagree with your proposition. I don't believe Australia is a tolerant society. That's been my experience. I can only tell you what my experiences have been. 
Uh, I've been on the receiving end of, of extreme racism, extreme hatred, extreme bigotry. Okay, that's been my experience and been the experience of a lot of people who I know. I mean, I recently traveled to Dubai. That is what I call to be a tolerant, multicultural society. Okay, it, it's ruled by people who are of the Muslim faith, but when it comes to Christmas, they've got the biggest Christmas trees. When it comes to Easter, they've got the biggest Easter eggs. Uh, there's people of all races, and they're all happy, and they all respect each other. That's a true example of a multicultural society that we should aspire to be like. Uh, so in terms of Australia being tolerant, that hasn't been my experience. It hasn't been the experience of my family. Uh, and, and I can only tell you what, I, what I've gone through. You have been at the receiving end of some pretty awful prejudice. Uh, there was the episode when you were a young lawyer when the judge actually mistook you for the defendant. Tell me a little about that. Well, I stood up to announce my appearance and, and, the, and before I had a chance to do that, he said, where's your lawyer? So these are the prejudices that I'm dealing with. On a, even from, you, you find that in the ranks of the judges. So it hasn't been an easy ride for me. What did you say to the judge at that point? I corrected him. He apologized. And, you know, life moves on.